welcome to the Australian Prescriber podcast. Australian Prescriber, independent, peer review and free. Hi, I'm Jo Chia and this is the Australian Prescriber podcast. Joining me today is Luke Ardolino. Luke is an advanced trainee in medical oncology and has written about immune checkpoint inhibitors in the Australian Prescriber. Welcome Luke and thanks for joining me. Thank you, thanks for having me. So let's get started. Um, Luke, could you start by explaining the immune system's normal response to a tumour and potentially some of the mechanisms that tumours use to evade the immune system? Yeah, of course. Um, I think um, a big starting point of tumour prevention actually occurs from the, you know, the inbuilt DNA damage regulation and repair mechanisms that we have in our, our body. And this involves P53 and numerous other tumour suppressor genes that initially work by activating DNA repair mechanisms for abnormal cells. Now, the, the damaged DNA in these malignant cells frequently causes the mutated cell to produce abnormal cell surface proteins, and, and these are called uh, tumor-specific antigens. Um, these abnormal proteins mark the cancer cell as non-self, so they can be recognized uh, by the immune system and ideally eradicated. Um, the immune system and the immune surveillance, sorry, is the uh, process through which the immune system is continually assessing for these markers on cell surfaces that, that identify the cells as non-self. And when these are detected, this results in a specific immune response. And this is a very complicated process, but um, natural killer cells play a, a key part in this. Um, dendritic cells also play a role activating cytotoxic T cells. Once activated, these cells uh, release uh, perforins, granzymes, and they punch through the tumor cells, resulting in apoptosis and appropriate tumor cell death. This process is incredibly multifactorial. I think the complexity of it is pretty well summed up um, by a guy called uh, David Lane. Now, he was one of the key investigators and the original discoverer of um, the tumor suppressor gene P53, and he essentially said to understand how cancers occur, uh, you must first of all understand all the reasons that they do not. Uh, the immune system itself um, likely encounters and eliminates malignant cells on a daily basis. However, uh, the malignant tumors tend to occur because there's been a failure in one or more of these protective uh, mechanisms. And this kind of brings us on to uh, mechanisms uh, by which tumors are able to evade <laughs> the immune system. Now, uh, there are many, um, so I'll try to focus on some of the key ones. But as, as tumours evolve, uh, genetic changes occur uh, within the tumours, which can sometimes give uh, tumours a survival advantage. One example is uh, tumour molecules can uh, downregulate the major histocompatibility compatibility complex, uh, which presents the tumour-associated antigens to the immune cells. Now, if that's downregulated or not present on the surface of tumour cells, then it means that the cells can no longer be recognised by the immune system. Another example of tumor cells evolving to protect themselves from the immune system is the ability to express inhibitory molecules on their surface. Now, uh, a key example of this is the expression of programmed death ligand 1 or PDL1. Um, tumor cells that overexpress this inhibitory molecule deactivate T cells upon binding and inappropriately result in the T cells identifying tumor cells as self or normal cells, meaning that the immune uh, mechanisms that would normally uh, attack these cells uh, are no longer activated. So thanks for that introduction. I think I asked you a big question because obviously the immune system is a whole subject on its own. But yeah. And you touched on there a little bit about programmed death ligand, but I know that you've mentioned a couple of other pathways in your article, such as CTLA4 and PD-1. What is it about these pathways that make it possible for drugs to target these pathways to reactivate T cells? So the first question, I suppose, is, you know, what, what are these pathways? I'll start with the CTLA4 pathway. Um, this is an inhibitory pathway. Uh, when it is activated, it downregulates uh, T cell function and results in immune dampening. Uh, interestingly, these sort of abnormal abnormalities in this pathway are thought to play a role in quite a lot of autoimmune dysfunction. The, the PD-1 pathway is a lot simpler, I guess, in so that PD-1 is again inhibitory when activated, it downregulates T cell function. But the PD-1 molecules are expressed on T cells and the PD-L1 or PD ligands are expressed on tumor cells. Now, tumor cells, again, manipulate this process by tending to inappropriately overexpress PD-L1, meaning that there's significant amounts of uh, PD-1 and PD-L1 binding and then that inhibitory signal is propagated and T cells again are unable to attack these cells because they incorrectly identify them as self. The way that these mechanisms can be 
targeted with drugs. Uh, you know, as we discussed, these are both inhibitory pathways that tumor cells have hijacked essentially to evade the immune system. Uh, but the, the drugs work by blocking these receptors. And this results in a subsequent appropriate immune activation by blocking the inhibitory pathway being completed. Um, ipilimumab is a, a fully human monoclonal antibody that binds to and inhibits the CTLA4 receptor. And uh, pembrolizumab and nivolumab are both fully human monoclonal antibodies that bind the PD-1 receptor, preventing it binding with its ligand PD-L1. And um, these both result in the prevention of immune dampening effects and subsequent immune activation. Um, the only other two that I haven't mentioned are, are davalumab and avelumab. Now, both of these are also monoclonal antibodies, but these, rather than binding to the PD-1 receptor on the T cells, they actually bind to the PD-L1 receptor on the tumor cells, but it results in a very similar effect. So can you tell us a little bit about what sort of cancers can actually be treated using these type of drugs? Sure. So, and the list is growing. There are many trials looking at new uses for these drugs and tending to be very successful. The tumor types of which immune checkpoint inhibitors have been most effective have tended to be melanoma, non-small cell lung cancer, clear cell renal cell cancer, uh, urothelial bladder cancers, and lymphoma. Now, um, what's quite interesting is this is actually predicted almost perfectly in a paper published in 2013, I think it was Nature, and it basically looked at the number of somatic mutations in thousands of different tumor specimens and then plotted them from highest mutational burden to lowest. And the three tumors with the highest mutational burdens were melanoma, non-small cell lung cancer, and bladder cancer. And those with the lowest mutational burdens were uh, CNS tumors, pancreatic tumors, breast cancers. And what I found really interesting is that those with the highest mutational burdens are the ones that have responded best to immunotherapies. Uh, and I like to think of it as, you know, the immune checkpoint uh, inhibitor drugs have removed the sort of invisibility cloak that tumors have utilized to be able to evade the immune system. And then um, when the immune system is finally activated, uh, immediately targets the most mutated cells. And maybe that's why there's so much success, but unfortunately it's a significantly more complicated process than that. I know just from my own practice, um, depending on different indications, sometimes the drugs are given as weight-based or flat doses, and sometimes they're given at different frequencies or intervals. Do you have any comment on why that may be? And do you also want to comment on if there's an optimal duration for these sorts of treatments? Mm. So yeah, I mean, uh, they are predominantly weight-based dosage protocols. Uh, nivolumab, I think, is given between one and three milligrams per kilogram. Pembrolizumab is a pretty standard two milligrams per kilogram. But again, these can all vary based on the protocols that they're being used in. Again, there's also concurrent use of immunotherapy where you give ipilimumab and nivolumab in combination for four cycles and then just continue with nivolumab alone. And again, the dosing changes slightly there. EverQ is a really, really good resource for this, and I'd recommend anyone sort of read through the drug information on EverQ about everything from dosing to side effects to management of side effects, and also the evidence base for why a lot of them are used. Uh, you mentioned duration. Now, that's a really hot topic in medical oncology at the moment. Certainly, these drugs should be continued to either, you know, the point of disease progression where they're failing to control disease or, you know, intolerable toxicities. And both of those would be good indications for stopping uh, these medications. But what about the group of patients who have a sustained or a complete response and are continuing to tolerate these drugs very well with minimal toxicities? Well, when do you stop? I think either way, the data is quite limited. And there's, a, like I said, a lot you know, research still going into this. But uh, one approach people are tending to choose at the moment is to stop the treatment after one year, provided that there's been an additional sustained response for at least six months. And then with a plan to have a low threshold for maybe restarting treatment if disease were to uh, progress while off treatment. Do you want to comment on sort of any characteristics that might mean a patient can't have these types of drugs? And also we know that these drugs can cause a lot of side effects and we'll get into it a bit later, immune related adverse events. So do you want to maybe touch on some of the most common side effects as well? Sure. So, I mean, given, you know, the immune checkpoint inhibitors work by blocking the normal mechanisms through which our bodies protect our own cells from inappropriate, you know, immune damage, the vast majority of immune related toxicities come from inappropriate autoimmune attack on normal body tissues any organ system can be affected. There's almost nothing that's off limits as regard to uh, immune-related toxicities and what can be affected. But common 
side effects tend to be skin toxicity, which can range from uh, a rash that just blisters to very rarely necrosis. Uh, thyroid toxicity is not uncommon and hypothyroidism tends to occur much more frequently than hyperthyroidism. Um, endocrine toxicities occur as well, not infrequently, and these tend to be everything from pancreatic failure resulting in type 1 diabetes to hypopituitarism, uh, adrenal insufficiency, and adrenal insufficiency is something that I have seen uh, quite a few times now where both adrenal glands have been completely uh, knocked out by immunotherapy. Diarrhea is common um, and colitis can occur. Uh, pulmonary toxicity with neonitis and uh, hepatotoxicity with increased transaminases and hyperbilirubinemia. The, these are the sort of more common side effects that you tend to see. Uh, and I suppose it's also just worth touching on very briefly, there are non-immune related side effects you can get with these drugs. And these tend to include anorexia, arthralgia, myalgia, fatigue, nausea, those kind of standard treatment related uh, side effects. Unfortunately, at the moment, there's no current predictive markers uh, for who will or won't tolerate immunotherapy well. And additionally, there's very few predictive markers of who will actually respond and who won't respond. pd one expression in lung cancer is one example, which I think you touched on earlier. However, there are a group of patients that we are very cautious about using immunotherapy in. These tend to include patients with uh, HIV, viral hepatitis. This is really because you can get a reactivation of um, the hepatitis B uh, specifically, but also poor viral load control in HIV as well. Also patients with pre-existing liver impairment as rising transaminitis and impaired liver function tests is a common reason to stop treatment. So if the liver function is already impaired, they're less likely to cope with immunotherapy as well. The biggest risk group of patients is really those with solid organ transplants and allergenic stem cell transplants. And these patients are at very significant risk for acute organ rejection, which would be obviously a terrible outcome secondary to immunotherapy. And then finally, the last group of patients we're quite cautious with are those who are of quite poor performance status to start with. And we tend not to give these drugs in patients that have an ECOG performance status of more than two uh, because they just don't tolerate the toxicities very well. You've talked about how, you know, no organ is sort of safe from immune related adverse events. So obviously these require quite a lot of monitoring and if something did go wrong then you would need sort of like a multidisciplinary approach do you want to talk a little bit about that and maybe what you might have seen in practice about how these sorts of things are managed and monitored immune related toxicities can actually be managed relatively effectively if caught early which is why whenever we're starting a patient on these treatments we have a very frank discussion that if they were to develop any evidence of toxicity whether that's diarrhea or shortness of breath they have a very low threshold for coming and seeking medical attention because like i say if caught early these effects can be very very well managed with usually just a short course of oral uh, steroids um, usually uh, prednisone and the emission of just one dose of immunotherapy with the plan to restart when these uh, symptoms have resolved. So th there should be you know, a very low threshold for sending these patients into hospital and should always be making sure that the overseeing medical oncologist is aware that they've had this complication. Luke, that's all the time we have for today. It's been a pleasure having a chat with you and thanks again for your time. Not at all. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. The views of the host and the guests on the podcast are their own and may not represent Australian prescriber or NPS medicine wise. I'm Joe Chia. Thanks for listening and I'll catch you next time.